Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am naturopathic Dr. Fiona Chin, co-founder of the Kidney Disease Solution and Kygenesis, and I am joined again today by the wonderful Dr. Ellie Campbell. If you haven't listened to our previous episode, Dr. Ellie Campbell was on just recently really discussing some of the really unknown causes of cardiovascular disease. So Dr. Campbell has been a family physician for well over 30 years. She's been in the functional medicine field for 17 plus years, which makes her one of the original functional medicine doctors. And she's also been an integrative practitioner for eight plus years, but she's just about to publish her book, The Blood Pressure Blueprint, which is all about treating and preventing cardiovascular disease. And we know that that's a major contributor to kidney disease. And if you didn't listen to the previous episode, Dr. Campbell, and I'll let you tell the story briefly again, got into it because of one of her amazing patients and what happened to Dee. So do you want to quickly share that story again? Dr. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for inviting me to share with your audience. You know, I think that um, we all have to recognize that it's the same root causes that trigger not only cardiovascular disease, but also chronic kidney disease and even cancer and Alzheimer's disease. So while we may talk about cardiovascular prevention uh, in great detail because it remains the number one killer in our country, any of these diseases are affected by the same root causes and can be mitigated by the same treatments. So we have such power to control our own health destiny if we recognize what tests we should be doing, what diets we should be following, and what exercise and fundamental health strategies we should be participating in. And this is sort of what took me along this path is because one of my very favorite patients is D. She was a spunky grandmother. I took care of her daughter and helped her daughter get pregnant when her doctors told her she was infertile. And she was the matriarch of her family and everybody loved D. I took care of her because mostly she wanted bioidentical hormone replacement therapy so that she could keep up with her much younger boyfriend. And she had high cholesterol and we treated that. She had high blood pressure and we treated that. Despite all of that, Dee had a massive stroke. And first she was paralyzed on one side and in rehab. And then that stroke extended into a hemorrhage and caused her ultimate demise. She died in the hospital from complications of her stroke. And I felt like someone had punched me in the gut because I was following the best evidence-based guidelines for the management of hypertension and the management of hyperlipidemia. And she had the very event that we were trying to prevent. So I felt like I missed something. And I spent the next three years studying everything that I could get my hands on about underlying root causes of cardiovascular disease. And I discovered many of them that were untouched and probably contributing. Among them, untreated sleep apnea is likely a contributor to many, many patients. Um, periodontal and endodontal disease, which we talked about at length the last time, and then genetics. And I think that if people have an understanding of some of the genes that they were born with um, that affect their cardiovascular and kidney disease risk, we can make very small changes that have huge effect in their ultimate outcomes. And so I wanted to share with your audience five genes today that I test on almost every patient because knowing what your genotype is can change your outcome. Yeah, that's great. And it's, um, again, like I said last time, such a testament to you to be really, you know, treating the person, not the disease and the cause and being so passionate that when one of your favorite patients comes to such a demise when you think you're doing everything you can that you totally change the way you practice, I think is a testament to your character. So oh, thanks. Yeah, well, I well, think it's... that this is what most doctors want to do. You know, we do with what we have and when we know better, we do better. And I, and my mission now is to empower as many patients as I can with some of this information, but also their doctors and their, their medical doctors and their dentists, because um, I'm, I'm teaching to those audiences as well, because while some of these were known when I was in medical school, the impact was not appreciated. And many of these things have been studied and learned since I was in medical school. And somebody's got to teach them because we're not in school anymore. So I'm taking that on as part of my mission to educate consumers, patients, clients, so that they have the most information and can go to their own providers and ask for these tests. 
many times their providers won't know what to do. So that's all right. We'll have an opportunity to learn together and then patients have resources. And now, you know, with the advent of Dr. Google and the internet, um, they can learn very easily once they know what to look for, right? They can Google KIF-6 and 9P21 and all these things we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. Right. Well, let's dive in. So, you know, the big genes that we learn are obviously the methylation pathways, but from talking to you, there's, it's far, and the APOE, but there's far more than that. So let's dive yes. into the five genes that you see have a huge impact on, you know, the potential increased risk of things like kidney disease and chronic disease right. and what, what we can do about them and how to test for them. Yeah. And I want to give a shout out to my teachers who taught me. Um, Brad Bale and Amy Doneen wrote this book called Beat the Heart Attack Gene. And so we'll talk about the heart attack gene first. But yeah. um, many of the, what we're going to talk about is in this book or on their website um, for some of the future developments that were not um, out when they first wrote this book. Mm -hmm. So the first gene I'd like to talk about is, the, is called the heart attack gene. That's what it's nicknamed. And its uh, genetic letter code is 9P21. And why this gene is important is it's not that rare. 25% of Caucasians and Asians are homozygous for this gene. So that's a huge proportion of patients. If they have this gene, they have a 102% higher chance of developing a heart attack or coronary disease at a younger age. Wow. So that's really high. They also have a 56% increased lifetime risk of heart attack and coronary disease compared to the general population. A 74% increased risk of developing an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So for those who don't know what that is, an aneurysm is a bubble on an artery, much like you get the bubble on a sidewall of a tire. That bubble can sit there for a while and not be a problem until just the right temperature, pressure, gradients hit it, it can burst. Mm -hmm. And if that vessel bursts inside your abdomen, you have internal hemorrhaging and typically die within minutes to hours of that rupture. It can be detected by an abdominal ultrasound and smokers have enough of an increased lifetime risk that if you have ever smoked a pack of cigarettes cumulatively in your entire life, you should have a screening ultrasound at age 60 to see if your vessel is weakening and you're starting to get a little bubble on the sidewall. And so having this key 9P21 gene and being a smoker significantly increases your risk of dying from that aneurysm. So if you knew at age 50 that you were a 9P21 carrier and you had smoked in your 20s and 30s, you might go to your doctor at a much younger age than the usual recommendation and say, I would like to be ultrasounded. Oh, and by the way, I'm really high risk for heart attack and stroke. I really want your full court press, do everything we can do to reduce my risk. I don't want you to treat me like the average bear. I want you to treat me like I'm a super high risk patient. And yep. having that conversation can kind of shake up your doctor a little bit. I've never had a patient come to me and say, I'm high risk. I want your full court, you know, your full, your full meal deal. What do you have for me that's, that you don't do for other people because I'm high risk? I would love that to have a patient be that engaged and interested. Yeah, and wow. the final thing is if you're a diabetic and you're poorly controlled, you have a 400% increased risk of coronary disease and a double risk of death because of wow. having the 9P21 gene. So I think all of us should know our status. Do we have this or not? If we're higher risk, then we can be screened more carefully. And if we're not higher risk, then we can go look at some of the other genes and see what those might be um, playing a role in the background for our health. Okay. Okay. The next gene is um, called the apolipoprotein gene. And I think many people are aware of this, but what we're learning now is that there's really, um, there's three genes that we concerned about and you get one from mom and one from dad. So there's many combinations of this. The APOE22s are the lucky ones. That's about 11% of the population, but they are actually at a decreased risk compared to average of developing Alzheimer's, coronary disease, or heart attack. So those guys are lucky. 
Also, their genetics allow them to tolerate and do better on a very high fat diet. The APOE2 patients eat, often should consume about 35% of their calories from fat. That's in the studies that have been done that shows their best outcomes. So these are the people who do really well on a ketogenic type diet, very high in fat. Yeah. On the other hand, the APOE44s, who are the, about 25% of the population, they do not do well in general on a ketogenic diet. It should be uh, managed very carefully by someone who has extreme experience in APOE genetics, uh, oxidative stress and inflammation numbers to be certain that they can tolerate these diets if they're choosing to, to eat this way. Um, and it's been hard for me to tell some patients who feel fantastic on a ketogenic diet that their brains are on fire and they're dropping weight and they have all the energy in the world. But I look at their laboratory data and their LDL cholesterol doubled and their inflammation went up and their C-reactive protein is higher. And I see all these this side, uh, side, um, serum evidence in their blood work of tragedies about to happen. So I have to tell them, please stop this diet. This is not good for you. And they're like, but, but I feel so well on it. Please don't take it away from me. You've come to me for my advice and this is my advice, right? So uh, it's hard. Yeah, especially um, when people are feeling well, that's a good distinction to make that even though you might feel really well on a ketogenic diet, you're seeing lab results showing increased cytokines and inflammation. So they may feel well, but that's not what their labs are showing, which is I think really important for because pe people get really tied up into how they feel, right? Right. So I think this is why working with a practitioner is important. And I don't think a ketogenic diet should be a DIY project. Mm -hmm. I really believe that you should be working closely hand in hand with a nutritionist and or a naturopathic physician and or a medical doctor who can run these laboratory tests and knows how, how to interpret them. Yeah. Now, most of us are a 3-3 um, type genotype. And that's about 64% of the population. And we should have about 25% fat in our diet. Um, it's, there is some evidence as well that, um, exercise affects your APOE gene differently. And, um, the people with the, mm, I'm not going to remember this, right? So let me look here. People who exercise, who have the APOE, three, three benefited from exercising before the meal, but yeah. to a lesser extent than people with the two, three genotype. And those who were the four, four didn't really get exercise benefit in their cholesterol. So, yeah. you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't exercise. Of course, it's just that it doesn't benefit you in the same way regarding cholesterol when you're a four, four, as it does for some of the other genotypes. Yeah. There is some evidence as well that the APOE Four fours who are at the highest risk for the development of Alzheimer's disease and coronary disease do not do well with alcohol. And we recommend teetotaling for the APOE four fours. And that's a hard sell, uh, but that's what we recommend because their alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes just do not work very well and they get much more damage to their cells uh, than, than the other genotypes. So um, you know, Alzheimer's disease has many of the same triggers as cardiovascular disease, and oxidative stress is one of those. And if you're an APOE44 type, too much fat and any alcohol drive oxidative stress, and they take it out on your brain cells. So, poor old yeah. poor, poor. So you want to be a 2 2, don't you? You do want to be a 2 2, but you don't get to choose your parents. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you should, in my opinion, know your genotype. I yeah. happen to be a 3-3. Three, three. That's the most common. So I can have a glass of wine now and again if I choose. I can have a moderate fat diet, 25% fat, and I can live my life pretty standard without having to make big sacrifices like some of these other genotypes need to. The next gene I'd like to talk about is one called KIF-6. KIF stands for kinesin family member six, and this is a protein transporter. This particular um, uh, gene is involved in making a protein that carries different molecules throughout your body. 
What's interesting about KIF-6 is how it affects the way that cholesterol medication works in our bodies. So the number one prescribed drug for high cholesterol in our country is Lipitor. In number, Australia. Uh, another one is, uh, is a Pravacol or Pravastatin. Those are very common. If you have the normal gene, 40% of us have this normal gene, KIF-6 will not allow Lipitor to prevent cardiovascular disease. It will lower your cholesterol, give you a false sense that it's doing its job, but you do not get the reduction in cardiovascular events that we would see if you had the gene variant, which is present in 60% of the patients. Okay. This is not true for simvastatin or for rosuvastatin, which is Crestor. All gene types respond to Crestor. Wow. So only, really, yeah. Only KIF6 um, genetic mutants uh, respond to Lipitor. So really, before taking any cholesterol medication, you need to have your KIF6 checked. There's no point otherwise. Or just ask your doctor to prescribe or sue the statin or simvastatin if you're not going to have the gene. Yeah. Right. And and this where I have seen this in my clinic most often is someone who's already had one heart attack and their doctor put them on um, Lipitor and they had a second event. And that's why they come to see me, because they're like somebody has missed something. I was following all the rules and guidelines. My mm-hmm. cholesterol dropped and I had an event anyhow. Mm-hmm. What could we have missed? And I have a huge list of things, but one of the first we do is the KIF-6, and yeah. almost always they're on Lipitor. And yeah. I tell them, we need to change that to Resuvastatin. And they're like, but it's not covered by my insurance. Atorvastatin is the one that's covered. So sometimes I can write a letter of prior authorization and explain their genotype and this data and get it covered. But now, fortunately, Resuvastatin is generic, and in our country, it's usually under twenty dollars a month, even without a prescription drug coverage. So, yeah. Um, so I think it's fascinating to when we go back and we look at some of the cholesterol data. If we tease it apart, they weren't checking for KIF six, but if we look at many of these prior studies that showed no benefit from the drugs, or they or there was a discrepancy of like the women didn't respond and the men did respond. We wonder what the KIF-6 genes were. And if we were able to tease those out, I think we would see the big difference. Those who who had this gene variant responded beautifully to those drugs, right? Okay. So I think um, I think it's fascinating. And, and I'm happy to know that we do this. In my in my clinic, I don't always run a KIF-6 because I usually just choose resuvastatin because I found it easier. Also, yeah. the benefits of statin drugs are so many more things than just lowering cholesterol. Lowering cholesterol is almost a side effect to me. I like what's called the pleiotropic effects. It's anti-inflammatory. It's uh, anti-cytokine. It reduces the amount of smooth muscle cell migration. It reduces the um, cytokines that the white blood cell makes. It enhances maturation of the plaque and takes it from a soft plaque to a heterogeneous or a calcified plaque and makes it more stable. And so if I give someone a statin drug and I'm watching their coronary artery calcium score, it may actually go up. It didn't mean their disease got worse. It meant their disease got more stable. Interesting. And that's a good thing, right? So when we use these statin drugs, I use them for these pleiotrophic benefits and we get those benefits on a much lower dose. So it's common for me to use a statin drug three or four times a week, not even every day. And that can dramatically reduce the side effects. Also note that the same pathway, this HMG-CoA reductase pathway that the statin drugs work on, that lower cholesterol, simultaneously lower coenzyme Q10 levels. And CoQ10 is one of our best antioxidants. Remember, we talked about oxidative stress being one of the major drivers 
of vessel disease, high blood pressure and inflammation. So we don't want less CoQ10, we want more CoQ10. And if this drug class reduces it, I always prescribe the two together, a statin drug plus a CoQ10, and that can mitigate many of the side effects. So too can lesser dosing. So um, knowing your KIF-6 helps us choose which medication, and that's more important if you have um, a, a side effect or a drug reaction to one and you can't tolerate it, maybe we can do your genetics and see if one might do better for you, not only in its efficacy, but in its tolerance. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah, the next gene I wanted to talk about was MTHFR. Your your audience may already know about this, but I, I have what I think is a kind of acute analogy of how this gene works. So it stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Any word that ends in ASE is an enzyme most of the time. And this enzyme is responsible for the methylation pathway in turning folate to methylfolate. And in this pathway, we're converting um, homocysteine into methionine. And if we cannot do that pathway, our homocysteine levels build up. Why is that important? Well, homocysteine is so critical for thinning our blood. If we have high homocysteine levels, we get thick and sticky blood, and that increases the risk of blood clots. So not only blood clots in our legs, but blood clots in our lungs. If we're pregnant, blood clots in our uterus, and that can lead to miscarriage and premature birth or even fetal demise. Mm -hmm. So we don't want high homocysteine levels. And um, homocysteine is also important in detoxification. So if you have a high homocysteine level, you don't detox very well. And um, Darwin said that our planet is would... Um, the species that survive are the fittest. We have survival of the fittest species. Well, for the 21st century, I truly believe the fittest are the best detoxifiers. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have survival of the best detoxifiers. Mm -hmm. People with high homocysteine are not the best detoxifiers. So they accumulate in their bodies pesticides, herbicides, petrochemicals, artificial flavors, artificial colors, flame retardant, jet fuels, whatever's in our environment they accumulate and they don't detoxify through their skin, their urine, their stool very well. Yeah. So having good methylation pathway is critical to having good detoxification. And then the third thing that um, methylation provides is the production of neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. So neurotransmitters are made in our gut and made in our brain. And if we don't have these high levels of um, neurotransmitters, we're at more risk to develop irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, dementia. So we want to have good methylation. And the way that I describe it is this. MTHFR stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. So folate is in that word. And folate or folic acid is vitamin B9. So you say, well, why don't you just measure my vitamin B9 level? Just give me a folate blood test and tell me how my folate is. Unfortunately, it doesn't work very well because if I use this analogy that if my vitamins are like fish floating in a lake, in order to be methylated, they have to put their floaties on. Once they get their floaties on, they can get up over the dam and go downstream and do all the good things that B vitamins do when they're methylated but they get stuck on the other side of the dam if they're not wearing their floaties. So I can draw the blood test and I can see all the floaties, all the fish in the lake, all the B vitamins floating in the lake, and you might have a huge number of them and your blood level might even be high. But if you can't get over the dam and do all the good things that vitamins do, you are going to be inhibited and you're gonna have low methylation. Mm -hmm. So what if I give you B vitamins already wearing their floaties? I give you a B vitamin, a methyl B12 or a methyl B9, and they're already wearing their floaties. Now you get all the benefits and your blood levels may or may not even change. They'll, they'll probably go up some, but that you may not know, you can't tell from the vitamin levels alone if you're getting the activation. We can measure homocysteine, we can measure methylmalonic acid, and that gives us some clues, but really, a lot of mothers 
of autistic kids recognize that their children are homozygous for MTHFR. They put a K and a couple of vowels in this mother gene, and it has a very ugly swear word nickname, mm -hmm. and they understand that their children do not methylate well. They do not detoxify well. They do not make neurotransmitters very well. And if we supplement them with these methylated B vitamins, we've seen miraculous transformations in some of these children. Yeah. So I think MTHFR status is something that everybody should know. Ideally, we should know it before we get pregnant because all OB gynecologists put their mothers to be on prenatal vitamins. What separates a prenatal vitamin from a regular vitamin is the amount of folic acid in it. But folic acid is the wrong B9 for people with this MTHFR gene mutation. And in fact, competes with and inhibits the methylfolate. So we don't want to be taking the wrong prenatal vitamin. And we want to know our MTHFR status. And we want our children to know their MTHFR status. There's two um, mutations that have been identified. There's many, but two are most common, the A1298 and the C677. And so you can have a T mutation or an a and, um, A1298C or a C677T mutation. And they're of varying severity. The C677T is more harmful if you have two of those genes. And the A1298 is not quite as bad. But for anybody that has this gene, supplementation with a little bit of methylfolate is usually needed, not in every case. It depends on your amount of oxidative stress. It depends on how much toxicant you're exposed to. It depends on um, your stress level. And so the more need you have, the more likely you're going to need your methylated versions. But not everybody needs them and not all the time. I personally take a multivitamin. I have C677T, one mutation, and I take a multivitamin that's got methyl B12 and methylfolate in it, and I'm covered. Yeah, I do the same thing, same gene. Yep. So um, the last mutation that I want to talk about is really interesting to me. This is called the haptoglobin gene, mm -hmm. and haptoglobin is a, a garbage truck. It's a cleanup molecule. Every we are, we know, most people are aware that we have red corpuscles, red blood cells that float through our body, and their job is to carry iron and oxygen throughout our body. Mm -hmm. The average red blood cell lives about 90 days in our body, and then it self-destructs. When it self-destructs, it leaks out the iron that was inside of that cell, and somebody's got to clean up the job. Somebody's got to clean up that iron because iron is a very powerful oxidizer, right? Mm -hmm. What's another word for oxidation is rusting and what rusts, but iron. So mm -hmm. we have to have a cleanup mechanism in our body and haptoglobin is that cleanup mechanism. A good haptoglobin molecule will do its job, take that iron out of the bloodstream right away, bring it back to the liver. The liver's gonna reprocess it and help to make new blood cells that have that iron recycled in it. However, if you have a haptoglobin gene mutation, instead of this beautiful dumbbell-shaped molecule, you get a mutant-looking molecule. A haptoglobin 1-2 gene, they sort of look like a flower with three petals. And a haptoglobin 2-2 two -two looks like a flower with six petals. They don't get in the liver the same way as the dumbbell shape, normal haptoglobin. So they don't do their job to clean up iron as well. Furthermore, um, there is an association of haptoglobin and the molecule called zonulin. Zonulin is actually a molecule called pre-haptoglobin. So why is this important? Well, when someone has genetic sensitivity, such as celiac disease or the haptoglobin 2-2 or 1-2 gene, zon uh, gluten activates zonulin. Gluten is that sticky protein that makes bread stretchy, makes the dough stretchy so that yeast can make it rise into that beautiful loaf for pizza crust that you like to eat so much. Mm -hmm. and Zonulin can cause leaky cell membranes. 
So mm -hmm. instead of the cells of the intestines being held and glued tightly together, zonulin interferes with them and causes them to be leaky. So now that gluten molecule can get inside the immune system, activate it, and then all kinds of antibodies can be made against uh, gluten triggering diseases such as type one diabetes and celiac disease. Yeah. Now, in a haptoglobin 2-2, zonulin triggered by gluten causes leaky endothelial membranes. The blood vessels become leaky. Wow. Why is that important? If it's in your kidneys, it can lead to proteinuria. It can mm -hmm. cause the kidneys to leak protein into the urine. If those endothelial cells are in your heart, now cholesterol, corrupted cholesterol that's inflamed, oxidized, cholesterol can deposit itself behind the drywall and build up plaque. If you have leaky membranes in your endothelium, the mouth bacteria, those gram-negative bacteria, those lipopolysaccharides, they can get into your bloodstream. They can get now through that leaky membrane into your blood vessels and set up housekeeping inside the blood vessel walls, or they can make their own plaque, or they can make inflammation, or they can drive cytokines, worsening the stability of the plaque and leading to plaque rupture. So nobody wants a leaky membrane. And if you have haptoglobin 2-2 genotype, you should treat yourself as if you're allergic to wheat. You should not consume any gluten. Yeah. So many of us have sensitivities to gluten in other ways. We may have celiac disease, which is a type of a gluten sensitivity. It's not truly an allergy. We can have a true gluten allergy. And now we have this haptoglobin 2-2 to throw in the mix mm -hmm. as a genetic gluten sensitivity that can lead to long-term complications of increased risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, and stroke. Uh, I'd like to share a case with you um, that I learned about at the Bayel Donin Conference. This um, patient actually came to our last meeting he uh, lived in Alaska, and he was a um, he worked for the parks department, and his job was to take care of national forests. So he was a very physically active man. He was out on his cross country skis, and he had um, apo lipoprotein four four, and I believe nine p twenty one as well. And he had had. Um, I believe, 12 stents in his coronary artery by the time he was 50 years old. Oh, wow. Every single vessel had been stented. And the cardiologist said, there's nothing left for us to do. There's no stents. If you form plaque anymore in your coronaries, that'll be it. There's nothing we can do. So we went to go see um, my colleague, Dr. Amy Donin, and she said, I don't know if there's something we can do. We'll take a look and see. And she was very scared because he was under really good care and they'd already done some genetic testing on him and they were already taking care of him very well following their, their paradigm. They did a test called a carotid intima media thickness test, an ultrasound of his neck artery to measure and see how thick the plaque was behind the drywall. And he was like in the 98th percentile for his age, like only 2% of people have more plaque than he did. But they discovered that he was haptoglobin 2-2. And they took him off gluten. And in um, 30 days of being gluten-free, he had no chest pain or angina for the first time in decades. Wow. He was able to do his cross-country ski routine. Six months later, he had reduced his plaque by 30% in six months' time. Wow. Simply by avoiding the trigger that caught the leaky membrane that allowed his corrupted plaque, his corrupted cholesterol to, to form plaque. So a simple intervention of gluten-free diet changed this man's life. 
and gave him hope for his future where he had previously been told there's nothing else we can do prepare for a premature death because we've done all that we can do wow that's amazing I yeah so it's amazing yeah i don't feel so bad taking so many people off gluten now <laughs> right right and you know here in the united states our gluten is is corrupted we've we've sprayed so much glyphosate on it it is so toxic to most people there's very few people who can tolerate american wheat without at least some side effect Fortunately, when we go to Europe or Asia or other parts of the world, I don't know about Australia, um, we get better gluten and it can be better tolerated. But not if you have the hapto haptoglobin 2 gene, right? It doesn't matter whether it's ground up or not. It's the gluten molecule itself that stimulates the zonulin that causes the leaky membranes. And zonulin then triggers this haptoglobin mutation to pour out the round haptoglobin into your bloodstream so it can't can't do its job that's so fascinating yeah i didn't realize that was linked to it all so yeah, yeah. so it's such as like you described with that patient such a simple intervention and had such a massive impact on him probably saved his life absolutely did and and not only saved his life it gave him for whatever years he has left i mean he lives a dangerous job he could fall off a mountain one day but now he has a quality of life to enjoy with his family without mm -hmm. symptoms and pain and a constant reminder that he was a heart patient. Because prior to that, every single day, he woke up and he's like, okay, I'm alive, thank you. But now I try to work out and I can't because I'm limited by my chest pain. Yeah, wow. So, so would you say in every patient, definitely with a history of cardiovascular disease or past uh, cardiovascular events you would run all five genes uh very commonly we do yeah. yeah and kidney disease patients what would you recommend for them i mean obviously if cardiovascular disease is the driver of kidney disease i imagine then you would just be checking right i think it's almost the same for the kidney patients because the haptoglobin um oh this is another story of i had a patient with uh haptoglobin who um, had uh, very high levels, microscopic amounts of urine, uh, protein in their urine, microalbuminuria. And when we put him on the gluten-free diet, all of his protein went away. He had no more proteinuria. And so mm -hmm. in a kidney patient, we use that marker as a indicator of the severity of their disease. But if it's really just an indicator of their exposure to gluten, we're getting the wrong marker. Right. And we're telling them, oh, your kidneys are getting worse. Your kidneys are getting worse. When in reality, you might just be eating more gluten. And yeah. so. So, yes, I think that's important, especially I think the methylation genes, the haptoglobin genes and the KIF6 gene, if they're not going to be on rosuvastatin, is important. If they're on a statin drug, we need to know that it's the right one. Yeah, you can guess by choosing rosuvastatin. But if you're not going to choose that one, then you need to know your KIF-6 status. And then yeah. I think the apolipoprotein is important because of how much fat and, and alcohol we're allowed to have. 9P21 is, is important, but I think all of our kidney patients are treated as if they're huge cardiovascular risk patients. So they right. should already be getting our full court press, our big full meal deal, whatever we have to offer. Maybe 9P21 could be skipped. Uh, right. especially if there was a very limited budget because um, the um, benefits of knowing it are not as great if yep. unless they're very young and wanting to know you know wanting to know if they're at risk if for example their um, mother sister and older brother were already chronic kidney disease patients and they came to see you at age 40 we might start with that test to see how risky they are yeah okay that's fair enough yeah wow okay so really i'm hearing number one you've really got to know your status of these things because that how you mitigate your behavior especially to say the haptoglobin or to the apoe you know just with your fat intake and things like that and obviously with methylation as well you can't you know we always say you can't be taking normal b vitamins because you're just going to block the pathways and make that worse right so, it all makes sense just to get those done as part of your standard panels and testing. You know, knowledge is power, I always say. So the more information. Right. 
So 9P21, the heart attack gene, APO lipoprotein B for Alzheimer's and cardiovascular risk, KIF-6 for statin status, MTHFR for B vitamins and methylation, and haptoglobin 2 for gluten. Yeah, perfect. I find, I just, I think that's all really fascinating and interesting. And, you know, we get taught a lot of these, but definitely not the KIF-6, not so much the, and I knew about haptoglobin, but I didn't know about its relationship to gluten. That's, that's. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah really. we are learning it's a cardiovascular risk factor, but we thought it was because of iron, right? Yes. Now we have this recognition that it's much more than just iron metabolism. It's about leaky membranes and yes. oxidation. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Fascinating. Okay, and all of this information will be in your upcoming book, The Blue Yeah. Blueprint. Oh, great. Well, as always, is there anything you want to add before you wrap up, Dr. Campbell? No, I just want to say thank you to your audience for being so proactive and taking care of their health, because the more proactive they are for themselves, their family members, their children, the healthier our world can be. And I believe that everyone who has good health can be their best self to achieve whatever God had for intended for them for their purpose in life. And I don't want anybody's health to steal away their life purpose. So being educated and empowered with information gives us a leg up on taking better care of ourselves and that's what the world wants us to do couldn't agree with you more it's all about you can yeah you have to do something with the knowledge i think what was the great thing you said to me i think the other time you have to do dig in and do the work Right. Yeah. So heart attacks are optional. Strokes are stoppable. And dialysis is not your destiny if you're willing to do the tests and do the work. I love that slogan and I couldn't agree more. And we always say, you know, we've got some great supplements that we're seeing do amazing things, but people are like, oh, did they just take the prime and the advance? It's like, yeah, they took that, but they totally changed their diet and they started exercising, reduced the stress levels. So it, uh, everything works together. There is no such thing as a magic bullet. So, yeah. yes, of course. No, it I takes really work. Yeah. yeah. And my, I told my husband, one of my teachers said once, it's harder to change someone's diet than it is to change their religion. So being motivated by your genetic markers um, sometimes can be that key that helps you to shift your behavior and change the diet because it can it can change your life. Well, yeah, just listening to those stories of the hepatoglobin and even the APOE with the fat, you know, like they are game changers, especially when you're seeing you feeling like you were saying, feeling fabulous on a ketogenic diet, yet your inflammatory markers are through the roof. So it's really important to work with a healthcare practitioner that knows what they're doing. And I'll put Dr. Campbell's details in below. If you've got cardiovascular disease can you, or any chronic disease where you want a really good physician that is going to give you the full happy meal plus some, then yeah. Dr. Ellie Campbell is your go-to. And as we mentioned last time, she does need to see you. But you're in Atlanta, aren't you? I am. Yep. She'll need to see you in person once, but the rest can be done online. So I think if you're really looking for a good physician, no distance is too far in my opinion, but that's just me. So I'll put the details down below, Dr. Cameron. We're going to have you on again because I know there's still more to this jigsaw puzzle of cardiovascular disease, and I really want to make sure we pick your brain and all your goodiness in there that you've got to share with us. <laughs> all right, always, my dear. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. Remember to hit subscribe and click like. That helps all our Google um, YouTube algorithms. If you want to know more about what we do, head to www.kidneycoach.com. Thanks for being part of our audience. Thank you for being proactive with your health. And Dr. Campbell, thanks again. We'll talk to you next time. Yes, ma'am. Bye. Bye now.